To Matthew. Glory Listen to yet another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent a son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, oh, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? Well, they said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read the scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So in today's gospel lesson, Jesus is yet telling another parable. I wonder if Jesus doesn't think that his crowd, which included the church leaders, the chief priests and Pharisees, were not getting his point. Or maybe Jesus knew they understood what he was saying, but they were not willing to admit it. Here, Jesus was telling another parable about his audience, especially the church leaders. I can't directly recall anyone or myself fully using this approach to get a point across, but what does come to mind is an Old Testament character that listened to a story told by a prophet and he had recognized himself in the story, that character being David. So, the Lord said to Nathan the prophet to tell David this story. 
There were two men in a certain town. One was rich, one was poor. The rich man owned great many sheep and cattle. The poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he had bought. He raised that little lamb, and it grew up with his children. It ate from its own plate and drank from its own cup. He cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. One day, a guest arrived at the home of the rich man. But instead of killing an animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guest. David was furious when he heard this. He says, as surely as the Lord lives, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are that man. The Lord, the God of Israel, says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wives and the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and stolen his wife. From this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you and you won't die for this sin. Nevertheless, you have shown utter contempt for the word of the Lord. By doing this, your child will die. Well, David fasted and wept while the child was alive, as he thought that perhaps the Lord would be gracious to let the child live. But then the child did die, and he said, But why should I fast when he is dead? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him one day, but he cannot return to me. Then David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and slept with her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son, and David named him Solomon. David recognized that he was the person in the story and confessed his separation from God, his sin. What he realized is that he had misused the power that he had been given. He used his power to take advantage of many people. This is really the issue here as well as in our gospel lesson for today. God had given the chief priests and Pharisees a great deal of power and control, which they used for their gain and not the gain of others. Does this sound a little bit like last week's sermon? Jesus is still making the same point. Today in our gospel lesson, we have a landowner, which we can relate to being God. The landowner gave us tenants, which can be related in a sense to the chief priests and Pharisees, responsibility over the land and an agreement that they would pay the landowner for the use of the land. The tenants thought that they would exert their power and control over the landowner and not pay him and keep the land. When it came time to collect, the landowner sent first his slaves to collect the payment. The tenants killed one and stoned the other. More slaves were sent the same treatment. The landowner then sent his son, thinking the tenants would respect his son. But no, they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. The tenants felt that since they were on the land, they were in control. Of course, when Jesus asked what would happen when the landowner came, the chief priests and the Pharisees said, oh, that he would put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the land to other tenants. Oh, but wait a minute. Who is Jesus really talking about here? Jesus reminded them of the scripture from Psalm 118. 
that the stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. The cornerstone was and is Jesus, which they were rejecting. Jesus tells them that since they are not producing fruit in the kingdom, that the kingdom would be taken away from them. Once again, they wanted to arrest Jesus, but he had the backing of the crowds as they looked at Jesus as a prophet. Thus, they were scared to arrest him. Jesus was really questioning how the chief priests and Pharisees were teaching the law. Well, you know, we would like to say that we're not like the tenants or the chief priests and the Pharisees. But my hope is that we might be able to see how we do reject Jesus along with the tenants and often can be blind. They somehow thought that if they took care of the son, they had it made. You see, the tenants' focus and the chief priests and Pharisees, they were focused on producing really fruit for themselves, not for others. But Jesus says... Kingdom living is about producing fruit for others. We are called to show our love to our neighbors. And here at Faith, yes, we do show love to our neighbors in many ways. The food pantry, all these quilts. But what might be missing? In listening to the YouTube videos for our Christ Kaleidoscope study that we have been doing, I've been reminded over and over again of the history that we are not teaching in our schools or churches about other races. We have spent a week or so watching YouTubes and reading about black people and now indigenous people. You see, we don't want people and ourselves sometimes to feel uncomfortable. But if we don't feel uncomfortable, then we are not learning the truth of what we white people have put other races through and continue to do so. On Friday night, I went to see To Kill a Mockingbird at the Wharton. And even though written in 1960, the issues with racism are still with us. They seem to be more and more camouflaged, though, in our systems. This creates a blindness for us to see our racism. You know, we often think racism is whether we like someone or not. Well, I like black people. I like indigenous people. But it is really more about words and ideas and how they affect others. At the heartbeat of racism is denial. Anti-racism is about confession. And before we can try and say that we are not racist, we are called to study the history of races and our role as white people in it. You see, it is not only about what is happening today, but it is the history of the races that brings us to where we are today. Many people are scared of not being the ruling race, but I don't believe that is the way God set it up. God set it up that all races are equal. And Jesus tries to tell us again today that it is about God's beloved community working together for the betterment and support of each other. I continue to discover my blindness and white privilege. It is an ongoing process as we have indo been indoctrinated to think that the white race is the superior race. I believe loving our neighbor is about learning about other races, their histories, how they are different, and how white people have had an effect on that. 
You see, when we learn about others' history, then we, it helps us to see that we are all equal in God's eyes. This will reduce our blindness in being able to love our neighbor. Let us pray. Gracious God, we need your help to continue loving our neighbors. Our history is so spotted. Lord, help us to learn. Help us to see through other races' eyes what they have experienced in their lives and may continue to experience. You have called us to love our neighbor, to use what you have given us for the betterment of all people. And so, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would come and shine that light to help us learn more and more that we may be able to wash away our blindness and love our neighbor. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.